I think we have everyone in, so we'll begin. I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's Lab to Table event discussing childhood trauma, brain development, and the justice system. My name is Joey Barnett, and I'll be functioning as your moderator today. I'm a uh, faculty member in the Department of Pharmacology in the School of Basic Sciences at Vanderbilt University. I have a longstanding interest in the criminal justice system and incarceration. This began when I was a graduate student here at Vanderbilt, working with Father Jack Hickey, who founded Dismas House, which provided translation, uh, transitional housing and support for the formerly incarcerated who lived in community with students. I continued my training in the Boston area and was a founding member of the board for uh, Dismas in central Massachusetts, where we founded a transitional housing community based upon the Dismas concept and coordinated engagement between the formerly incarcerated educational institutions and social service agencies. Upon returning back to Vanderbilt as a faculty member, I've remained active as a volunteer for several years at Riverbend Maximum Security Institute. So today's event is housed, hosted rather, by the School of Medicine Basic Sciences as part of a monthly series of conversations connecting basic biomedical research to real life topics. And today we're really excited to have with us scientific experts on neural development and community leaders who work with restored citizens to discuss the intersection of how childhood trauma impacts brain development and behavior and how these changes are subsequently linked to heighten risk to become involved in the justice system. Research that we will discuss today is centered around the CDC Kaiser Permanente Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And this is a study that looked at the presence of certain events within the first 18 years of life and how they affected later development and engagement. The 10 ad adverse childhood events identified include physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, mental illness, presence of an incarcerated relative, being in the presence of a mother who's treated violently, substance abuse in the child's environment, and divorce. During uh, our next hour, please place any questions you might have in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. We've also received numerous questions from our res registration prompt, and we'll be answering as many questions as we can at the end of our moderated discussion. I'm pleased to turn our conversation now over to the experts and have our panelists introduce themselves. And we'll begin with Pierre Cabell. Pierre? Uh, thanks, Joey. Uh, my name is Pierre Cabell. Um, I'm 29 years old. Like I do music. I am sort of do a lot of community activism now. Uh, prior in my life, I was uh, kind of wild and had a, a moment of incarceration. Um, it was very uh, empower, impactful on me. So uh, now I do the most to try to try to balance the scales out with that. Wonderful. Thanks, Pierre. And I'd like to jump to Trina. Hello, my name is Trina Friars, and I am founding CEO for an organization called Mending Hearts here in Nashville, Tennessee. And our mission is to assist homeless indigent women due to core current issues, meaning that we are looking to address not only the addiction, but their mental health as well. And so the majority of our population is coming from a homeless background as well as incarceration. Thank you, Trina. Rich. Hi, uh, I'm a professor of um, molecular physiology and biophysics at Vanderbilt, and I'm a developmental neuroscientist. My lab is interested in how alterations in nutrition early in life change brain development so as to predispose individuals to metabolic disruptions and changes in body weight throughout life. Thank you, Rich. Mark. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Wallace. I'm also a professor here in the Department of Psychology. I'm the former director of the Vanderbilt Brain Institute. Um, my research interests and emphases are on how we sense and perceive the world. Um, but part of the reason I'm a part of the panel today is also I have a strong developmental thread to that work, understanding how sensory systems and perception mature as children grow. 
Great. Thanks, everyone. So let's start by thinking about how these adverse childhood experiences correlate with events in later life. And so I might turn to Pierre and Trina to tell us about your experiences about adverse childhood events in yourselves or the populations that you're helping. Pierre, you want to jump in? Um, sure. Um, so I first heard about this study about like a few years ago. I never really heard about it uh, before that. Um, but I seen as soon as I heard about it, I realized how important it was or how impactful it was on my life and people around me. Like uh, the things that happen to us as children, uh, especially like going through poverty and like with a specificness on like go, being hungry, being hungry. Uh, we might not notice it as kids, but as adults, this, this makes an impactful thing. So like person who is stealing things like this, or like why they think like this, why they move like this, why they act like this, like small things in that nature kind of shape our whole personality uh, later on in life. Uh, and as I was uh, as I was incarcerated myself and I would meet other men and they would like tell me their stories, I realized that my story was a lot similar to their stories. And if you if you could pick a point to where this was like the beginning or like this is where the story kind of went askew. It was always within those like those first couple years of being alive and that that the interaction with their parents, did they receive love type of thing like that point. Great, Pierre, Trina. Oh, you're on mute, Trina. <laughs> uh, being here, uh, working in this population for 20 years, you know, uh, I've come across it several times, but, you know, I think back to when I was incarcerated and I was in a residential treatment program, you know, and I always ask myself, how did you come up with 17 felonies, right? Uh, and, and, and why you, when you really thought that you come from a decent background of a mother who raised six children on her own single mother. But I think back to where my addiction was inherited from, which was my father who was took his disease of addiction all the way to his bedridden illness. Um, and so when I look back at that and I have the visuals, I think about the, the verbal abuse, the dysfunction in the family. I think about, uh, the verbal abuse that my mom took, but I also think about uh, his health and, and, and how much of that was um, attached to this. And so as I work in this field today, thank God I'm here and, and I'm more educated and not the professionals like you guys are, but I'm a little bit more educated with some experiences of my own life and, and, and and looking at the abuse and neglect that I put on my own kids while in addiction. But now I get to see it from a different aspect of the women we serve here at Mending Hearts. And what we see is a whole lot of trauma issues that um, not only has been inherited, but these women come in here truly paralyzed in fear because they don't know anything else. And they've been contained in this vulnerable, violated condition. And so how do we break the cycle? Um, you look, you look at the ACE, and it's 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 a true breakdown of who we are, <laughs> where we've been, but it also helps us identify, you know, um, the areas of need. And so I'm grateful that you guys are taking this on and helping not only us uh, to become more aware, um, but you know, I, I think about when my stress comes in a daily function of situations that happen at work, you know, I go back and think about this, you know, uh, and, and so prevention stays at the forefront for, for me, but in my prevention, it's more so awareness. Thank you, thank you. Now I have to, jump in a little bit from my own experience of many years now working with those who are incarcerated or who have been incarcerated. And when you look at that list of adverse childhood events, you can, you can easily see that many of the men and women that we serve have experienced over half of them easily. And that there's a common thread that goes through uh, many of those who end up incarcerated. So 
we'll maybe turn the discussion now a little bit towards um, Mark and Rich. So how does childhood trauma impact brain development and behavior? What do, what do we know about that? And maybe even more importantly, what are some of the questions that are still open about how these types of events might impact behavior? And Mark, would you like to lead us off? Sure, thanks, Joey. I, I think one thing, one thing that really comes out of this study that I wanna reinforce is, um, and, and both you know, Trina Pierre and you, Joey, referred to it, is that trauma really comes in a number of forms. And I think one of the things that society often does is it associates the term with a single traumatic event. When in fact, you know, many people grow up in an environment where trauma is simply an embedded characteristic of the world that they live in. The other thing I think is an important qualifier is that we often you know, talk about trauma in the context of a precipitating event. But in fact, I think the absence of certain things in life can also constitute early life trauma. Now, now coming to your question, Joey, I think probably what we know the most about is the impact of, of early trauma on the brain's stress response. Um, that what ends up happening is that, that, that early lifehood experience, life experience of trauma really heightens that stress response. And what that stress response magnification does is it has a host of what we would call cascading effects on a variety of body systems, um, including our ability to regulate our emotions, our sleep, our immune function, and then really through the immune function, the manifestation of other diseases. Um, one thing again that Trina also uh, reflected on was that it also greatly increases the risk of substance abuse. Now, if we move into the brain, I think two of the most, or I guess best characterized brain related changes that are seen in early trauma and stress some of this is work that comes from animal models, some of it is work that comes from humans, um, is that we generally see the formation of less synapses. Um, these are sort of the major, you know, what I would call the, the, the major computational elements of the brain, but also changes in functional connectivity patterns. And put this in simpler terms, we can say that the brain um, is wired a little less effectively, but also that the patterns of wiring are very, very different than in a child who grows up um, in, in a lack of trauma environment. A couple areas of the brain that are deeply affected, although these effects are seen everywhere, there are areas I think that are really important because they map back onto some of the behavioral changes we see. We see significant changes in a region of the brain called the amygdala. Um, and what we know the amygdala is important in is it's important in fear and important in avoidance responses. Um, we see major changes in the area of the brain called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is one of the core regions that is responsible for learning and memory. And then finally, one of the areas that I think has been best studied that we see changes in is an area called the prefrontal cortex. That area of the brain that we associate with what we call executive control, or really a lot of our ability to regulate <clears throat> other aspects of our behavior. Now, I want to end just my my initial statement with just one important caveat from all of this work. Um, and it comes back to the question you had asked, Joey, which is some of the open questions. And one of the things that we've learned in any of these studies of trauma and early stress is how much, um, how many enormous individual differences there are in terms of how the young brain responds to trauma and, and stress. And I think in a perfect world, what we would want to do is eliminate adverse events, right, that early trauma. But I think a thing that we really need to also focus on is how do we better understand why some brains are more resilient than others and how might we, might we be able to use that information? Thank you. Yeah. Rich, would you like to jump in and add to that? Sure. Uh, that was a great, uh, great set of comments leading into this. And um, there's been a lot of progress recently in what happens to the brain. Now we've known for decades that early experience is a problem for behavior. And uh, the understanding of how the brain develops and how it gets wired up has uh, returned a focus of behavioral problems that happen into adults to early life. 
as uh, you know, Pierre mentioned, the first couple of years of life are just critical. And what's happening here is your brain is getting wired up. And what the brain does is it assesses the external environment and it also assesses the internal environment, your digestive system, your heart, your lungs, immune system. And what the brain does is it puts those two sets of information together and integrates it in order to elaborate adaptive behaviors, behaviors that are good for your survival. That's how it's supposed to work. So this plasticity that occurs during development, the reason this process is labeled is you want to tune the individual's responses to be appropriate for their environment. Now, what if the environment is a problem? Then that can disrupt that problem and you embed that adverse environment in the way the brain works. And the way it does that is that we know now that environmental signals and factors can change the wiring of the brain that Mark was referring to and patterns of functional connectivity, the way one part of the brain talks to another part of the brain. And if the brain is not doing a good job of matching the internal environment's needs with the external environment requirements, you end up with a disease likelihood. And the one that uh, my lab has been studying is obesity or metabolic dysregulation. Um, Trina mentioned uh, the heritability issue of certain behaviors and each individual comes into the world with a unique genetic makeup. And, but then that genetic makeup is exposed to two sequential environments. There's the, the in utero environment that we all grow up in before we're born. And then there's the neonatal environment when we're babies. And then there's the environment throughout life. And there are critical periods of brain development, periods when certain things are happening. There are periods of time when brain cells are being born and they differentiate. And then there's a period that in humans uh, begins and occurs mostly prenatal, but extends into postnatal life. And in mice incurs entirely postnatal where neural connections are formed. So how the brain talks to other sets of cells in the brain is established during this period of time. And if animals, uh, experience, animals or human ex, uh, experience trauma of a variety of forms, and one particular that uh, I'm talking about is food scarcity, it's really bad for the way the brain regulates body weight and hunger. So you think about the power that hunger is on behavior. And Pierre touched on this, that I think uh, with the, absolutely, I don't know if that, I, don't, I have no idea about the data, but I, I, I would think that hunger motivates crime as strongly as anything. It is an absolute, one of the strongest drives in, in uh, biology. And so you can imagine if your early nutritional experience affects the wiring of your brain so that you're predisposed to hunger, even when you have enough food, or if you have a small amount of food, you are more hungry than someone else, it's going to change your behavior. Your motivation to seek and acquire calories will override everything else, including your fear of being incarcerated. So th this idea or body weight. So in our society, we tend to look at obese people as a moral failure rather than a biological embedding of nutritional aberration that may have happened early in their life. That individual is obese, but feels hungry. So that doesn't make sense to most people. And I often say that if you go out in the street and you ask somebody in the street, how do you cure schizophrenia? None of them will have an idea, but they all think they can cure obesity because they think it's simply, you just need to eat less, but it's just not that simple. Hunger is embedded in neural circuits in the brain. And those circuits talk to every other part of the brain. And hunger is going to shut those other things down and make you pay attention to the fact that your brain thinks it needs food. So uh, the critical periods for this, uh, we know some about what happens in people. The best example is the Dutch hunger famine that occurred at the end of World War II uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, Germany blockaded food availability to the Netherlands. And so there was a, an intense famine. So women that were pregnant during that period, their children tended to be much smaller. Their babies were much smaller than you would have expected. And then as those individuals were followed throughout life, clinical data was showing a much greater propensity to metabolic 
problems, diabetes, and heart disease. So it was a like a, a very unfortunate clinical experiment on a population of people that showed how susceptible development is to uh, food scarcity. So in our country, it's uh, abundant food availability and especially availability of high fat foods. And a lot of work has, been, has gone into that. And it turns out that if you have either too much food when you're young or too little, they both disrupt the development of the circuits in the brain that determine how you feel hungry, how you, how you sense hunger. So it also has a negative impact on the neural circuits that bring information from your gastrointestinal tract. So you've got a collision of misinformation happening in the brain on the circuits that are defining whether or not you feel hungry. So this is something that individuals will carry with them throughout life. And you know, probably 20 years ago, we were very depressed because we thought, okay, you're just done for when this happens. But we're starting to understand these critical periods now can be reopened. And so we're looking for opportunities to understand how that happens. What factors reopen a critical period and allow the brain to become reprogrammed for a healthier set of behaviors? So some combination of learning to manipulate genetic events and also combining that with behavioral therapies, uh, we think can uh, make for a much brighter future for people who, whose brains are wired for metabolic dysfunction. Great. Thank you, Rich. So Pierre and Trina, in your experience of the individuals that you work with, you think about these adverse childhood events. We've heard a lot about hunger, and that's a great model or prototype for how the, you know, the interacting with the environment might alter the brain and the way we encounter the environment and others. Um, do you see commonalities in the way ACEs play out in those you work with? Are there particular ACEs or behaviors that have been encountered that you find particularly hard to overcome or particularly um, abundant in the populations that you serve? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad he touched on this, uh, this thing about food. Um, in the community I come from, uh, there's a, a certain term that we use as uh, comfort food, right? I'm, I'm from the South, so it's like a comfort food. And uh, a lot of the times we, we touch on this, this term is comfort. And I wonder, always wonder, like, what is what is the opposite of this, though? Right. If, if, if comfort is this food, what, what is the uncomfortable part? Right. Um, me being just personally as a child, I remember my first times ever getting into trouble with the law was for stealing food, not not anything else, but just food. Um, and it, it was just such a, a strong fear in me. You know, like the times when we did have food, I can closely, closely relate those to a good part in life. And the times where we did not have so much, I definitely associate them with negative things. And uh, as I got older in my life, it was like uh, other things that were not necessarily food were still based on this exact same thing, though, being hungry or going without or like this will ultimately lead up to this. Um, and a lot, I feel like a lot of people I, I'm myself, I'm not obese. There was a time I was a little bigger, but I'm not obese myself. Uh, <laughs> but I, I feel like the the education of this type of thing is extremely important because a, a lot of people, they don't, they don't know themselves. A lot of people are going through this situation of uh, like, man, why am I eating like this? Or why am I doing this? And they do not have the, the ability to articulate it. You know, they, they don't have the education to know this is why I'm moving like this, or this is why I'm acting like this. Or, and to them, they just feel like it's normal. They've been dealing with this or going through this their entire lives. So, so for them, this is normality. When in reality, this is not necessarily a normal thing that every man is going through. So uh, yeah, I feel like studies like this are extremely important. Mm -hmm. Trina? Thanks, Pierre. You hit it on the head when you talk about comfort food. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, I personally um, can agree with that because one is I am an emotional eater. Um, hmm. I, I get that one is because um, I believe that my mom um, actually provided comfort food, the homemade biscuits and, you know, the grits and the, you know, the smothered rabbits and everything else. So, um, but she was also a baker, 
You know, uh, it wouldn't be one cake on Sunday, it'd be two or three cakes and a pie. And we're just talking about a regular Sunday dinner. But part of that was her way of comforting us through the verbal abuse and the dysfunction. And so she needed to pay or into, she had to have that love to pour in to kind of balance and show that, you know, we were loved unconditionally. But part of that also is, you know, hey, uh, don't throw nothing away. <laughs> Eat everything on your plate, right? Um, and so part of that is uh, my upbringing of always eat all your food. My mom fixing every time we were hurt or, you know, here, go to the store and get you some candy. You know, uh, that, that, that thought of fixing things with food uh, has accumulated in my life. And, and, and today, I, I, I do have a disorder of eating on emotions. And so I've gotten better over the years. I can remember being incarcerated, and all I wanted to do is sleep and eat, right? And you eat up all the zuzus and wham whams because they don't provide fresh vegetables in there. And so I went in there, probably 180, and I came out 450, you know, and it took me probably eight years to get that 150 pounds off of me, right? And so, you know, um, it, it was a struggle. But part of this is I found along the way of having the assessment, identifying with my trauma, I eat off of emotions. With the women we see here today, they're coming in. We serve 90 plus counties in the state of Tennessee. And we're the largest female full continuum of care in the state of Tennessee. Now, is that the largest treatment center? No, but that is the full continuum of care, meaning we're covering all bases through that clinical process. And so when we get them in on the first end of detox, they're really in survival mode, right? And so they're just coming off of getting high and whatever. And like they're eating everything they can. Part of that is, is that they're exhausted. But after the wake up of 72 hours later, you really get the meat and gravy of it. And then you get to see what's the real underlying issue. You don't get to the depth of it, but you get to see some of that. And what we've seen is um, the emotional imbalance of communication. We see that, you know, um, a lot of them are afraid to speak. They don't have a voice. They've been shut down by verbal abuse, by rape, by sexual abuse. Um, they've been, pretty much their spirit has been sold, whether due to addiction on their own, whether due to, you know, a man being in charge of their life. But we see a lot of that. And as they come through, some of them struggle with conflict resolution. You got one that's either going to take a hike and run because they don't want the conflict, or you're going to take one who has authority issues, right? But then we also have the woman who is so timid and afraid to even speak. Uh, it takes months to get her emotionally balanced. And so we see so many different side effects. But here's the other piece of it. We have women stashing food early on. You know, they don't... Mm -hmm. Listen, they got a bag, so we got to call the roten man in because we didn't find a bag under there. It's been there for a couple of days. And, uh, you know, there, there's so many survival units. And so getting to the core of it, when you hear their stories, you can really attach it to the ACE because it helps identify like, whoa, this didn't just start because of incarceration. This started here in the childhood, you know? And so a part of that also is our women around here eating again off emotions. So I get to share my experience a lot personally about eating off of these emotions and, you know, putting them into therapy and getting these assessments done and looking at getting to the exact nature of those core issues. But I think the ACE is a powerful tool that helps a lot of programs identify why we're stuck, why we need prevention, uh, and giving them a platform to really talk about what's really hurting, 
Because when we get through with all of this, we're trapped in pain from early childhood trauma. And then how do we exit? How do we make the exit? And I think the AC gives us that opportunity to help look at it and see a strategy. Yeah. So Trina, that's that's great. What I, what I hear is, you know, individuals who've had these traumas and, you know, that list, those aren't separate things. They're all interconnected. And I think probably due to this altered wiring, we get altered behaviors and inability to uh, experience the world, maybe the way it should be. Why would you stash food when you have access to your food? Um, how so Mark and, and Rich, how do some of these behavioral uh, challenges that, that young people might experience, how do they alter senses and perception of how they recognize and interact with their environment? And is what might be the biology that underlies that, which in the end may result in an interaction with the criminal justice system? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really good point, Joey. And I think, you know, the, the simple answer to it is, you know, these types of experiences are basically changing, dramatically changing the way we view the world because they're dramatically changing the wiring of the brain, right? Those circuits that we were talking about earlier that are altered in early development are the circuits that are allowing us to receive information from the world, process that information appropriately. And as Rich talked about, really drive what we would call adaptive behaviors, things that would help us survive in our environment. So these early childhood events, you know, in addition to a lot of the acute changes that we see, they have these longer term changes in changing the nature of our perceptual system so that we tend to, you know, see the world in a different way. We tend to perseverate on certain things and ignore other things, right? And that I think is, again, you know, it just sets in motion what I would call a real, um, you know, sort of a, a series of negative feedback loops, right? Where the, the ultimate end point for that um, seems to me in many cases, it has to be incarceration, right? It has to be um, some, you know, behavioral decision that ultimately drives going to jail. Mm -hmm. um, one, one comment that I do wanna, I, I just really wanna come back to something that Rich said, because I think it was an important point that, this notion, I think we've all heard a lot about it recently, partly because of the tra tragic events up in Buffalo last year of food deserts, right? That, that often you know, communities that are socioeconomically um, struggling are places where you really don't have access to the types of foods that would promote the development of a healthy brain. So I think as a society, that's something that we really need to think about um, and, and, and take on head on because to me, you know, if we don't have those early eating habits with the right food, then we are setting ourselves up for having a brain that, um, you know, is going to be different in different in ways that may result in um, behaviors that, you know, we would end up with incarceration. Yeah, that's, that's a great point that people we often think about, you know, food scarcity as being not enough. And in Western societies, it can be too much of the wrong kinds of food. Mm -hmm. So there are experiments that we've done where just during uh, lactation, when the mice are nursing from their mother, we give the mother a high fat diet. And then the, the offspring have a normal diet. And then as adults, their brain wiring is not normal. Yeah. And their ability to sense calories is not normal and they have metabolic problems. So they've, they've had a perfect diet during the time of life that they could decide what they eat. But during the time when they're dependent on their mother, just the mother's diet altered the structure of their brain and the way their brain regulated body weight and glucose metabolism. So, you know, it, we, we talk about the food deserts, but another one that's going to be increasingly problematic at in the United States are water deserts, real deserts. Yeah. So water scarcity has not been studied nearly as much in how it affects brain development. We have some experiments that just started looking at this, that if we pharmacologically induce dehydration in young pups, it, it alters how the brain circuitry that controls food intake develops. So here would be water scarcity could lead to enhanced hunger 
in an, in an or in a person or an organism throughout life. So that's a I think as in parts of the world that experience both food scarcity and water scarcity, they're getting a double hit possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what do you do about it? The encouragement is we have to understand how these traumas and stress get encoded in the brain. And if we understand the code, hopefully we can recode that brain and make it easier for that individual throughout life. That's the sort of the holy grail, I think, of this developmental field. Um, but there's a lot of encouragement now. So let's pick up on that. When we think about this holy grail is how do we retool the brain? How do we reprogram it after these miss events that occur during adolescence? And Pierre and Trina, I, we will probably all have the same opinion on this, but uh, you have successfully navigated that. So I'd like to hear two things, I guess. What, what was important in helping you be able to you know, do that and, and uh, recover from these events? And did the criminal justice system help? Oh, uh, good questions. Um, so one, uh, I would say probably the strongest thing that helped me kind of like break this cycle was just education being educated on what was going on. So uh, like, I'm glad uh, Rich said something to the point of like uh, food and like food deserts. If you are anybody who's ever tried to like work out for two weeks and like, hey, I'm gonna try to eat better. You might've failed, whatever. Uh, as soon as you go back to like eating like negative foods, you understand that like, man, I feel bad. I don't feel like this. And in those, those places, like it, everything, almost everything that is consumed is coming out of a bag or a box or a can. There is absolutely nothing fresh. You know, like my mom, she has a house now. One of the most luxurious things that she has in her house is a garden, just simply so she can grow her own, her own uh, vegetables or something fresh. Um, and it's just hard for people in those situations to try to like, even if they were aware to try to like get out of that, like in their minds, it's like, man, if, if you, if I'm going through poverty, it is a lot simpler for me to go buy a pack of ramen noodles than to go to Whole Foods and buy anything, you know? So like that, that's kind of the mindset of it. So I completely understand. And uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I feel like prison didn't really make it any better at all. I feel like almost every, every negative point in my life that I can think of right now, being hungry is kind of like one of the major points like if if you ask your average person or average man in prison especially where i went to um like what's the top three worst things of being in prison if not number one number two is just going to be like we're hungry mm. you're hungry just being hungry and i know that's that, that sounds crazy but just like you you it's hard to even like to get the the nutrients you leave, even if you have the food, you are just constantly hungry. You are not like nourishing your body with none of the things that you really need. Um, and it's just that that connection between like what you eat and like your mental health is extremely important. So me educating myself on that was definitely a thing that kind of put me in the game. Great, thanks, Trina. No, I, I, I think it took, some, it took me several times uh, you know, the revolving door in and out of incarceration. And I could say that, and uh, probably first hundred times, I don't know how many times, but um, those first couple of times, uh, it was just a wrist area, I would say, or a containment uh, camp. Uh, but those last two trips uh, were effective for me. Uh, I, I was able to get into a treatment program uh, for 18 months uh, while being incarcerated. And I got to look at some things and I got to uh, receive some therapy, some real therapy. Um, and I, I, I was released. Uh, and I think uh, what helped me is that I was released um, with nowhere to go, but back to where I came from. Um, and so that was one of the barriers that I faced on that trip. I didn't last but two months and I found myself incarcerated again. One is because I was a felon, um, multi-time felon, and nobody was hiring felons back then. So all I knew was survival, again, going back to what I know. And that last round of incarceration, 
uh, was enough for me to wake up, but I had to go back and repeat the program that I did prior to from a relapse prevention program. And I think the key for me is that they did a deep dive in the therapy process for me. And from that point, when I got released, they took me into a housing program. They picked me up from jail and took me directly to the housing program. The first day I got to that housing program, they put me into clinical services, which was an intensive outpatient program that had therapy and a psychologist on site. And so I went from incarceration straight into service. But one of the beautiful keys for me that helped me is that there was a therapeutic process involved and engaged. And there were people helping me in this process that had lived experience. And I think that's what's missing a lot of times in the process of our healing. You know, we, we, we can find our spiritual components, uh, we can find our clinical components, but we need all of them. And oftentimes, um, as addicts, I'm going to say, and, and, and I've experienced it myself, I am, um, I, I hold back from giving you my all, right? You're the psychologist or the doctor, and I'm not going to tell you all my truths, right? But if I've got a person with lived experience who has succeeded, I'm more opt to give them my whole truths because they have lived experience. And in an effort by sharing that with them, they guide and direct me back to you so that I can give you my truths. And so I think that's a, a thing that may be missing in the components, but yeah, incarceration was beneficial for me. And I got to look at a lot of my trauma from the neglect of my father, um, and I also got to look at my abandonment and neglect that I put on my kids. So I got to look at a lot of that early on. If I can uh, piggyback off of that real quick. Um, so there was two things you said that, that I really liked. So as much as I hated the, the, the experience of going to prison, one of the major changes in my life was going to prison, not the prison itself, but uh, the company that I work with now, Healing Broken Circles, meeting them. And another point you made was... Uh, how you need people who actually been through the experiences it would not have been nearly as successful if the people in there had not been through the same stuff in life that i had been through and like they it the fact that they would just introduce themselves and talked about and we would talk in just such an open way you know prior in my life most of the people who would try to help me would just be talking from situations they had never been through before you know like <laughs> trying to tell me about and, and that's always the vibe I had it's like man you yeah okay good advice but you know what I mean you you ain't never been here you don't you don't know what it's like you know what I mean like it's cool to say like don't yeah don't commit violence or don't do that but you've never been there you ain't never been into the streets yeah. and almost everybody in there all had life experiences to show and stuff that I had never even been through that myself you know and it, it created a sense of respect once and authenticity authenticity in what they were saying and uh, I feel like that that is a, a strong thing when you were trying to teach somebody or educate anybody or help anybody is like who is the information coming from I, I could probably tell everybody in here how to shoot a three-point shot but uh if Steph Curry say it uh I'm gonna do it I don't care what he say <laughs> left hand with the, this one you know what I mean I'm gonna do it um so yeah both both of those things are extremely powerful yeah yeah that's yeah those things resonate um I'd say the top three conversations with folks in the prison is about the food. And, For sure. and, and I also think Trina, what you mentioned is that, and both of you, that you've got to walk with somebody who's experienced some of these things because you don't tell people that you have these experiences. People don't discuss them, right? And so there's some trust that has to be built. Maybe that's a part of that, part of that rewiring. So, you know, where do we go from here? I mean, we've learned some things. We've, we've learned that these events and having these events in our lives can put us on the wrong trajectory. We know that there's some rewiring that, that needs to be done. We know that there's some social engagement and healing that needs to be done. But how do we as a society do that? I mean, how do we as individuals contribute to that? So I'm gonna put that hard question on the scientists first. 
<laughs> How's that? So, Mark, where do we go? How do we, yeah. how do we help? Yeah, it's a great question, Joey. Obviously, you know, I do not have the answer, right? But what I can say is, you know, and I think both Pierre and Trina are great examples of this, right, is that um, there are wonderful success stories out there. And learning from their experiences can, I think, really provide a roadmap for um, if, in fact, you end up, individual ends up incarcerated, right? What are some of the things that are necessary in order to, to break that pathway, to take them into successful careers? Um, and I think, you know, the, what I heard multiple times in different ways through the conversation today is, um, you know, Rich said it at the beginning, um, the adult brain can change, right? I think, you know, even when I, you know, I'm an old man, right? When I went to graduate school ages and ages ago, one of the dogmas was that, you know, the adult brain was pretty hardwired. This wiring that we talked about wasn't changeable. Well, we know a lot more now that that's not the case, that in fact, the adult brain can change pretty dramatically. And what I'm hearing from the conversation today is, you know, two major themes, right? One, nourishment of body, and two, nourishment of mind, right? Those two seem to be really critical in terms of how you ultimately, um, you know, change the adult brain in a way that it becomes, you know, more, to use that word again, adaptive. So like a good scientist, I didn't answer the question at all. Um, but I, I, I just tried to riff off of what, what some of the you know fascinating conversation we've had up to this point has been about. I, I, I think you did a good job. So I do want to get to some audience questions, but quickly, Rich, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I I just definitely want to agree with what uh, the, you know Mark Pierre and Trina have said because it is it's going to be a healing team that puts it together. There isn't a psychiatrist sitting in an office that's going to be effective. You have to have people with lived experience that that somebody who's uh, facing these challenges feels comfortable with. An obese child doesn't wanna to talk to somebody who looks like a mid distance runner and talk about the problems they're having with food. And, but we also just, we need to understand the biology of how the brain can change throughout life. And we're very, very early in that road. We're encouraged, but it's very, very early. If Mark and I had the answers, we'd be setting up a boutique on Rodeo Drive and don't become <laughs> billionaires. So it, it's a really, really hard problem. And we have to help people now. And the most effective ways are uh, with uh, you know, interventions that break the cycles and then behavioral therapy that help individuals understand themselves better. Good, great. great. And uh, Pierre, Trina, anything else to add other than the advice that you've given us? Um, so awesome. Well, that was a tough question to ask him is, uh, what can be done? Yeah. Um, I also would not, uh, do not have a, a concrete answer, but like, I feel like the best thing that I could do is what I do now, which is like working with organizations like healing broken circles. Um, so because they do so much work as in like, as far as teaching people about their cognitive skills, how their brain is wired, why, like most of the stuff that I learned to be able to be up here to talk with you guys, I learned from them, you know, and that's just such a powerful thing to just educate somebody, especially on themselves. Like you, you could teach somebody about a, a bunch of things, but the more you know about yourself, the more you're able to control your own self, your own environment, and to influence other people who are doing the same. And uh, I mean, every every most of the people that are uh, that I work with, they are they got they got records. They uh, they they done been drug addicts before. They done hit robberies before. And I know to some people that seem like a negative, but if you were trying to reach that young child who was about to go down that path, that is exactly the man who would be able to tell him like, hey man, this I know exactly what you're going through, and this is how you change it. So uh, definitely, just working with 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 organizations who putting the effort in. Effort got to come first before anything get done. Thanks, Pierre. Trina, a few words before we go to a couple think, questions uh, from the audience. <laughs> well, I, I, I think uh, Pierre hit it. And, and, and what I'd like to add is that, you know, uh, we can continue to make these jails. We can continue to have uh, confinement units. Um, but when, we, when you think about why we originated jails, you know, the lingo uh, they use was restored. <laughs> Uh, with restoration, right? 
um, we said, you know, we, 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 we want to put people back to living in good health and good behavior. Uh, but when you look at the prison and the jail systems, are we doing that? Uh, say, say one out of a thousand, yay, you know, uh, but uh, I think in an effort to provide true prevention from repeat offenders and, and closing the revolving door, I think we have to focus on um, can the housing programs be the new jail? Can, uh, can I serve my time in a true rehabilitation program with support of psychologists, therapists, lived experience counselors, peer support? Uh, can you teach me living skills? Because part of what we're dealing with as people being recovered and restored from my mental capacity is, it's not all about the condition that I was inherited with, it's the condition I was left with from the inheritance. Nobody was there to break the generational curse for me. And so oftentimes we're on two different silos and we got the middle class and the lower class. And how do we bring those together to become an upper class? And so I think that it's going to take the village to come back to the table. I think we're going to have to go into these homes, these recovery homes, uh, and, and try to keep them out of prison, but have the real true conversation. You know, it's, 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 a, good, it's a good time to have a good dinner and have a good get honest meeting. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So we've talked a lot about hunger. And I just wonder from the science side or from your experience, are, are, are there particular ACEs? that are associated with incarceration? Is it, one might, maybe there is, maybe maybe it's not. Each of this brain substrate is acted upon differently. It's trauma, trauma, or how do we, how do we measure that? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's a $64,000 question, Joey, right? I think we don't, you know, part of the criticism of much of the work the animal model work that's been done is, you know, is that trauma really comparable to what a child growing up in, an, in a negative environment would be? And the answer is clearly it's not, right? So those wiring changes that you see in those animal models, how much can you say they really reflect what's happening um, in a child's brain? And I think the answer is, you know, we simply don't know very much. Um, one comment, if I can, I just, I, I really want to shout out just to Pierre and Trina too. I think another thing that came out when the two of you are talking that I think is critical, and you both exude this, is a sense of purpose. Both of you have a profound sense of purpose, and I think that's such a critical motivator in life. And it's very clear just in getting to know the two of you, you know, that that purpose is what drives you, and I think is really what's been a key element of your success and moving forward. So sorry, I did, I'm now on the term, but I just wanted to point to that. Absolutely. And th I, thank you for noticing that, man. I feel like a lot of people in, uh, in my position, uh, your, your brain and the way you people perceive you would change if you actually have purpose in your life. And if yeah. your purpose is not to eat tomorrow or where you're going to live tomorrow or where you're going to sleep tomorrow and you have a greater purpose, right? I, it's extremely important, man. Thank you, brother. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to ask another question. Um, we've talked a lot about these events and, you know, there's clear biology behind these adverse events. There's, you know, clear data, the associations of these behaviors with, with bad things happening. How, how widely are these awarenesses being shared and strategies to obviate some of these being shared across educational communities, whether they're educational communities in behavioral research or in elementary school or in the populations that you serve? Are ACEs part of the conversation? Trina? <laughs> I, I'm laughing uh, because um, before then, I was I was just flashing through, and I'm sorry. Sometimes, you know, with when you got ADHD and all that kind of stuff, you kind of multitask. But what one one of the things I was laughing about is because I don't think that ACEs become a part of the circle or the conversation 
until there are behavioral problems. And that's oftentimes, especially in schools. Now in clinical settings and treatments and things of that nature, hey, that's part of the process. It may be part of a grant funding cycle, right? It may be part of the assessment to get to know the individual. But when we're talking about early childhood, uh, I, I just don't believe that those come about until our children are in trouble. And so how do we make that part of the early development learning process to help identify early on what is my child really struggling with? And I think this is real key for uh, you know, people who are adopting kids, right? <laughs> do you really know the background or do you really know the socioeconomical piece that may could affect you in the long run? Like, um, so I, I, we see it here, uh, but we're, again, we're part of a treatment program. Uh, I don't think that our supportive housing programs see it a lot. You know, uh, and I just don't think our schools bring these out. I don't even think that the juvenile system bring it out until this child has had more than one offense or it's truly an abusive offense. <laughs> I, I, for the jacking of the cars, I don't even think they bring them out. So I think um, I think it's a hidden agenda somewhere. Well, it, it seems to be an extension of a number of other problems that we have that we deal with symptoms instead of early intervention. And yes. if we could expand the healthcare net so that most more babies got early assessments. I know in the metabolic area, you mm -hmm. could identify kids very early on. They were at risk for metabolic dysfunction way before they walk into your office diabetic when they're nine. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the behavioral. That's a simpler uh, problem to identify than a behavioral issue. But that early intervention, the one thing we do know is the earlier you intervene in neurodevelopmental disorders, and we are talking about neurodevelopmental disorders here, the earlier you can identify and intervene and with an appropriately targeted intervention, the more successful the outcome. So I see no reason that behavior is going to be any different than some of the, the, the ways like Billy Rubin screening, why that was so successful. But how many kids are going to, going to get this? Uh, we're going to have to make sure our national policy of healthcare is more informed with the biology we already understand. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. I've got a, I'm going to ask a final question here. We've got two minutes. A final question from our audience. And I'm maybe going to throw this at Mark as a, as a sensory integration person. It, is there a particular age that children might be at risk for negative effects from these types of, or any type of traumatic experience? Yeah, I, I think it comes back. I think Rich may have mentioned this even earlier that generally, you know, the most vulnerable brain is the youngest brain, right? So I would say that, you know, during the first four years of life is when a large component of that wiring that we discussed is taking place right now. Keep in mind that continues well into the twenties. Um, but nonetheless, when you look at the growth curve for that wiring pattern, you know, those first four or five, six years are really the most important. And I would argue probably then the most susceptible to the impact uh, of early life traumas and stress. Yeah. Yeah. Can you add a minute for any other comment about that, about that importance of thinking about this early? Uh, so I, I didn't even know, like, uh, if it was like a scientific thing, I was just going to guess and say about five years old. And the uh, only reason I was going to say that is about that's that's about the time when uh, when we as young people start paying attention, finding our heroes, who are we looking up to, who are we who are we trying to model ourselves after? So, uh, yeah, definitely about that age. Well, um, I'm showing uh, 259 plus and getting close to the to the hour. So. I really want to thank our panelists for just a, a fascinating discussion. I want to thank everybody for joining us today, including those on the Zoom, so we can learn more about these intersections of childhood trauma, brain development, behavior, and the justice system. And uh, we will we'll be following up with a link that will be available to everyone so they can see a recording of this event. And I hope that everybody online and members of our panel will continue to join us for this monthly series. 
We appreciate your attendance and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, enjoyed it. Thank you.